we had a long chat last week about that journey of um, the different teams you coached and um, I suppose one thing you mentioned was being very true to your view of how you, 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 you thought the game should be played and um, I suppose sharing that with players and trying to enthuse players in that way. Um, like you said, regardless whether it was the, the young kindergarten group or, you know, uh, a junior team or up to a professional team. So in, in that sense, what's your, I suppose that, that, you know, like that philosophy of our style of, of you want the game played, what, what does philosophy itself mean to you? Yeah, I think it's a really important uh, thing to, to start with. Um, and it's important to, to write that down and I guess to even keep evolving that as well. So the philosophy of that, how I want to be a coach or how I want the game to play is basically around three or four key words for me. Um, and that's around speed, skill and space. So I'm certainly uh, really, I've done both attack and decoach, but I, I am really a, a sort of a attack mindset type of a coach. And if we can get that we do things faster than the defense can get set, so that's our speed. So we need to position fast. And then we've got the skill set to be able to execute that and play a wide, wide, a wide, wide game. And then that's where the space is. So that'll be the three key things for me, for me around that philosophy and how I want to coach. And then everything, sort of, I just try and stay true to that. All the language that I use or, the, or the, the calls that we use as a team or the vision or the values that you have, that's all connected and aligned to what my philosophy of how I want to play the game and how the game should look. Sorry, guys, if you hear noise in the background, that's a, a bit of a meltdown at bedtime in the Malloy household. So <laughs> you'll, have to, you'll have to excuse that. Um, and I suppose, as you said, that's very much how you would have grown up with the game and how you wanted the game played. Um, have you always been able to create that, uh, made that, make that common amongst the coaching team? Or you've been in many different roles, sometimes as a head coach, sometimes assistant coach, sometimes a skills coach. Have you always been able to impart your own ethos in, in some sense in it? Yeah, I've, I've tried to uh, stay true to that philosophy and, and to myself around that. So I haven't tried to vary too much in that. So even when I was um, you know, at Ballinar, when the grasses used to be a little bit longer and the, the field wasn't quite as, uh, quite as dry, I still think that we still tried to play um, that style of rugby and that style of game. And I, and I remember talking to a number of guys at the time that, oh, that's not really how we play it here. But, and I was going, why not? Because to me, you've got to really enjoy, enjoy the, the players have to enjoy the, the game and how it's played. And the coaches have to enjoy that as well. So for me, that means scoring tries. Um, yes, it's great to win, but if you're focused on sort of performing and upskilling and developing individuals, then you can play that no matter what, what sort of the weather is. You just got to just dig a little bit deeper into the detail of the skill, I think. And the, you, mean, you mentioned there you did chat with some of the, the, the older guys who might have been grounded in their ways and saying how that's not how we play here. What, what comes to my, mind with me sometimes is when uh, Rob Penny came over to uh, Munster and he implemented a style of play which is probably commonplace now but at the time it 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 hit that obstacle it, it kind of it never really truly had or never appeared to have buy-in um from the players and they quite often revert back so when you hit those challenges well i suppose initially how do you get that buy-in how do you come into a a group who played a certain way and how do you you know create that buy-in both from the coaches the club the players yeah, so I think one of the really important things to do is probably with you guys at this time of the year, when it's a little bit of uncertainty and strange times, that you do have those that opportunity to have a lot of conversations and meetings uh, and get alignment on how you want to try and play the game, attack and defensively. Uh, and that's a really good way to start. And it creates some really good conversations, but also builds relationships with your coaching group or your committee or, or even your players, 
So for me, that's, that's one of the most important bits to start with is around, so you've got a philosophy that hopefully individually that you have a, as a coach and then you start having conversations and try and get alignment with how you want to try and play the game and then you get your either leaders of your, of your playing group in um, or it doesn't matter if they're, if they're younger, um, you just sort of try and get on the same page and making sure there's a, there's a saying in New Zealand that you're just all on the same walker and going in the same direction. So a walk is a boat. So you don't want to get on a, a rowboat or a boat and some guys are trying to row it a different way. Um, so we can all get on the same walker, then you're heading in the right direction. And that's, it's a really good way to start. So you have that conversation where this is how I'd like us to play the game. And this is uh, what we'd like to do. And this is why. So we nail those things and then we go into maybe around uh, goals or um, a vision and values of, of, your, of your team or, or club. And then you, you're sort of halfway there. And then when you're planning your sessions, that it's still, everything's still aligned and in the same, heading in the same direction back to your philosophy. Because what can happen in a game and in games is that you can get put under pressure with win or losses or um, dynamics from your group or stuff going on. But if you vary away from your philosophy or your, your, your values of ha what you have, and then it all sort of gets put into the washing machine and gets muddled up. And I think that's where you can get yourself into a little bit of trouble. Is that what you mean by staying true to your philosophy? So when, when you hit those hard moments or results are going your way or, or maybe some factions of the group aren't, aren't fully buying into it or, or diverging away from it, is that, that what you mean by staying true to it in those moments? Yeah, 100%. And, that, and that's the hardest bit. Like, you know, coaching's, coaching's not a sort of a perfect science or anything like that. But what can, can derail it is, is going away. So you've gone in there and you're saying all this about your philosophy or your values or what your goals are for the team. And then you play five games and you're none from five. Well, do you, is the same language that you're using five weeks ago what you're using now? And that's the, that's, that becomes a really difficult situation to handle. But I think if you are true to how you want the game to play and your philosophy is nailed, then you'll stay true to that. You might have to make a couple of adjustments and a couple of selection changes, but um, I think a big picture, that's, that's really important. And I think I've, I've done that right from when I started at Ballinar a long time ago to even to today. And I still coach a lot of different teams. I still coach my son, who's now in the under-13s. Um, I'm coaching the first 15 uh, in Dunedin uh, because I can't get to Japan at the moment um, and helping out with Otago doing some skill stuff as well. So, I suppose, how important is that to you to, to stay fresh? So even though you, you, you can't be with your, your own team, which is your, your, your job, your role, um, is it important to you to get that experience or, you know, get that different rugby in, in New Zealand or even just stay fresh um, as opposed to just taking a break from it while you have the opportunity? Is, is it a constant learning, I suppose? Uh, it's definitely a constant learning. I, I just get bored, mate, if I'm not doing, playing uh, coaching rugby. Uh, I love the game um, and I love coaching. And so even over the lockdown period, there was no footy on. Uh, it was difficult to watch replays all the time. So just looking up things to reading and, and lots of stuff like that and looking on online about what guys are doing and what teams are doing. I uh, went over my last season. Well, I think we only ended up playing six games, but really went over that with, you know, really dug down to a lot of the stuff that we were trying to do and trying to make improvements. Uh, and I think that's really important that you're constantly sort of making improvements to your game. Um, because the game's changing so quickly and with the new, the new law interpretations now around the breakdown in New Zealand, a few of those guys, super guys, are finding that difficult. Um, but what you also have, because all the referees, doesn't matter what age um, they're refereeing, are watching that. So they try and implement that to under-13s or, 
for the first 15. So um, you're sort of always trying to tweak and make changes to, to your ball carry, to your breakdown, uh, to your clean out and all that stuff. So. Well, the, the game itself is evolving quite a bit as well, with, even with rule changes. They're, they're so common in rugby that, you know, getting a look at how other coaches are, you know, different environments are dealing with it gets you a step ahead. Just a, a very good uh, question in from uh, Di Newman, your, your successor at Ballina there. Um, he was just intrigued by that, um, the, staying true to your, your coaching style. Would that have an influence in how you'd look at teams that you take on? Would you ever look at teams and say, you may not be suited to this team or this club and, and vice versa, you're very suited to, to others? Uh, I, I definitely, I, I, yeah, I believe that would be definitely true. Um, so, um, around, I guess around my experience around, so I, I was always going to be back in New Zealand between May and, and September. Um, and a couple of schools got in touch with me around helping out. Um, and there was a couple of schools within Dunedin that I, I didn't really like how they played the game. So I didn't really think that it was aligned to, to my philosophy. So I went to a school that's uh, probably the fourth or fifth ranked school in the Dunedin competition. Uh, so I could have gone to the best school, but I actually liked the way this school uh, held themselves, tried to play the game, and the kids in it, it's sort of maybe a little bit like myself, a little bit of battlers and country kids and... So I just wanted to help that school out, whereas I could have gone to the best school, but I didn't really want to because they were a little bit more of a forward orientated sort of put it up the jumper and carry hard. And, and that's not really how I like to coach. So I ended up going to John McGlashan. So. Just delving into the, the other aspect you're saying you spent a lot of time on, which I suppose feeds from the vision, the, the philosophy. Is, is that creating a vision of how you want to play and the interconnection then with the roles and responsibility of players, which is again connected with the, the skill set of the players. So um, I know you may, you may have some stuff you want to show us on that as well. So feel yeah. free to just ask me to, to um, set you up there whenever you need. But what's, what's that inter interconnection um, and how reliant are they on each other, the, the vision, the roles, and then the, the skill set of the team themselves? Yeah, look, I think it's huge. Uh, it's massive, really. So, so once you get your, your sort of chatting to your coaches and then your team's starting to come together and it's just about to kick off and, and you're having a meeting, you maybe your first meeting, and you're like, you, the most important bit, I think, is that you get everyone participating in that. Because if they participate in it, then they'll buy into it. So it can be just a goal session. It might, doesn't have to be a vision and values. However you want to do that is the most important bit, I believe, is that they participate in it. Players, coaches, and even club committee. So then because if it's just one person putting up a slide or putting up stuff on a whiteboard, then it's really just his vision or values. So having a participating and meeting and everyone having their opinion and then everyone at the end of it, which is the most important bit, is everyone buying into that and agreeing to try and live that daily is probably the best bit and the most important bit. And then when times get tough throughout a season, that you can always go back to that. Because if someone's behavior is not what you agreed to or what they said they would do, then you can challenge them on that. So the most important bit is to, it doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be a whole, you know, two or three meetings. I've just done one with our school and it, it took 45 minutes. And everyone participated, they got a lot out of it. They set their goals, their expectations, a few rules. Uh, the coaches explained how they want to try and play the game. And that was all done in 45 minutes. So I don't think if it's done well, it's, it's not really a time thing. But the importance of that, so we, we, we played a really good game against one of the big schools. Um, we should have won, just lost by two points. So the boys were really happy with their performance in the weekend. Um, we had to travel two and a half hours away. And unfortunately, we ended up losing in the last minute of the game. Okay. And the boys are really down. But 
all I could keep going back to was where our goals are this, our expect, expectations and values are this. So we just, we just stay on track and make sure everyone's on the same boat and we're all heading in the same direction. So, that, so it's that, really important to set that meeting up for your season. So, so the, the, out, the outcome of the game, obviously that's a, a secondary or an uncontrollable, but you have your goals along the way. And like you say there in a, in a school side in New Zealand, how common is it to, in, in New Zealand for that to be a collective um, vision setting or goal setting arrangement? Would it filter, how, how far down the youth rugby would it filter? And Yeah, so there's like some of the, some of the schoolboy rugby uh, in New Zealand's uh, at a pretty high standard and they've got some pretty amazing programs. I've been, I was coaching the New Zealand schools in New Zealand under 20s uh, a couple of years ago. So um, what New Zealand Rugby Union does a really good job of is getting all of that information uh, and I guess processes down through the grades. And a lot of schools have now taken on a lot of that stuff. So uh, they're, they're quite, quite well ahead of their rugby programs. Um, some of those top schools up north are some pretty good, pretty good programs. So I think it's not so much about that. It's about making sure that whatever you do, that you sort of still stay true to what you do and who you are. Uh, just a, a question in there from uh, Brian Tallon as well, um, which would be common to a lot of the, the coaches in the group here who are working with um, youth teams and you alluded to their schools that might have uh, excellent programs and, and we'd have similar in, in Ireland um, where there'd be disparity, but particularly in the club game, you'd have a, a mix of, I suppose, what you call elite and participation players. Um, so what's your view on that? And, you know, what are the, what are the possibilities or the challenges of a coach um, creating balance in, in that? Yeah, and that's, that's the really difficult bit because um, for me, they've still got to enjoy it. So uh, there's got to be a fun element in there. Um, you still want them to be in the game uh, when they're 40, 50 years, years old, maybe back coaching. So it's, it's not as easy as sort of just doing that. But I reckon the, the most important part, everyone's got to enjoy what they're doing. doesn't matter what age they are. Because if they enjoy what they're doing, then they'll come back to training the next week and the next week. And they'll stay in the game for longer. So, and look, I've coached at super level and that's a massive part of that as well. So it can't be just all serious and all business-like because if those guys aren't enjoying it and the environment's not right, then they don't play as well. So it's, that's a massive part of it, is making sure that it doesn't matter what group you're doing, could be the under-13s, could be a first 15, that they're really enjoying what they're doing. Would, would you be enjoying <laughs> Sorry. Would you have experience of um, working with a group like that and, and how do you create the environment where you challenge the best and help them achieve their aspirations, but at the same time challenge the, um, the weaker players at the level that they're at and not pushing them beyond, beyond their capabilities? Yeah, and I guess uh, that's, that's sort of the art of coaching. Uh, it's, it's not an easy one. Sometimes you get it wrong. Um, Sometimes you're, you've gone in and you think that your expectation is that they know a lot more, um, they're a lot more skilled, uh, they're a really good group of rugby players, uh, but then there's a big gap. So I guess I, I, I sort of go back to Balanara a little bit. Um, I, remember, I remember turning up and there's some guys that had actually never played the game before. And there was guys that had been playing all through the junior levels. and uh, I was the coach and um, the, my first year there and then we always had to train Friday nights uh, because the students were coming home and sometimes I'd be there by myself and we'd have 50 players or 60 players. So a lot of the students, I think we sort of got that enjoyment back into Ballinar and then there was um, sometimes there was just lots of players around <laughs> and some of them hadn't even played. So I had to try and get that balance right. So you had to be quite well planned. Um, you had to think on your feet, I think, was uh, another one. But the planning was massive. Um, I always spent 
you know, every training, just making sure that everything was planned and organized. Uh, because if you care about your training and you're well planned, then the players will care about it. And then they'll start turning up. I think when I, that first year I went there, um, you know, the first preseason few trainings, we might have had 15 or 20 players. And then by the end of that year, you know, we're getting 50 to 60 players playing for the turning up for trainings on a Friday night. So. Did you find that created its own problems then where, you know, you might have gone from a smaller group who were quite experienced to a much larger group with a, you know, very much varying experience and potentially dragging down the skill, the, the average skill level of the group. Um, did, that, did that cause problems or how did you, how did you cope with that? Yeah, it does. Uh, it certainly does cause problems, as you could imagine. Um, it's a little bit frustrating at times. Um, but I try not to let that frustration get to me, I suppose, as, as best as possible. Uh, sometimes you can't, <laughs> you sort of, you know, might blow it a few times. But I think the other thing is around asking for help. So there's people in the club that will help. Um, and you can't always do it by yourself. Um, and I've sort of learned that over the years as well. So. Uh, just a, a question that come in for a few, from a few people on probably taking a holistic view of that um, philosophy approach. And in your experience in, in New Zealand or Japan, um, is, it, is it possible or what are the challenges to marrying a, a philosophy of the elite game with the grassroots game? Um, so probably tied into that question of dealing with the elite player and the, the weaker player, but in a holistic view, uh, is it possible to have that, you know, that joint vision where either within a club you have your, your senior team who are a main focus, but a lot of your youths might be participation or even a provincial setup like the, the Highlanders, how do they combine their club and community part with that, that elite side and developing those elite players as well? Yeah, so uh, when, I, when I moved back to New Zealand uh, to take on the Otago role, that, that part of that role was being director of coaching. Uh, so what I tried to do was from our, uh, all the way down to our under 35 kgs and under 14s, under 16s, under 18s, uh, Otago B and the Otago team, is all playing the similar style of rugby. So, and we had... A similar, so we had our shape, which, um, which we, which you guys will be doing over there, is around the one three three one, and we had a style of rugby that we would try and play, and the reason why I tried to implement that at all of those, so this is you know uh, 11, 12 year olds as well, um, so I got had meetings with all those coaches to try and get them all aligned with the type of rugby player that we'd be able to develop through to the hopefully play for Otago and the Highlanders. And so one of the reasons was we had the stadium with a roof over the top of it. So prior to that, we always had um, pretty wet, cold conditions. So we wanted to sort of create a rugby player that was really had a lot of speed, a lot of footwork um, and a high skill level. So we tried to implement stuff and calls and everything down to the lower levels. And part of the whole process was getting all of those coaches and group of coaches on board. So very similar to treating it like a team. This was the style of rugby, my philosophy I wanted to go with. Um, and that was given to all of those different coaches. And then everyone was trying to sort of play that type of style and have similar language throughout the whole, the whole thing around skill sets. So we'd, I wouldn't say dumbed it down, but we've broken it down a little bit. So that was important. And I think that's something that all clubs could do um, because everyone wants to, you know, keep their guys in the club for a longer period of time and go through the ages and through the teams. Uh, and hopefully, you know, your good ones might end up going on to play provincial rugby or international rugby. In, in, that, in, in that process of development, there was components of it that suited everyone. There was components of yes. it that, that fitted with clubs, fitted with underages. Sure, the best players would move on and, and potentially become elite, but even those who didn't, they, they developed, they, they'd still develop better raw materials from the process. Yeah, and that's right. So they also, also knew all the language that the senior guys were trying to use 
yes, it wasn't quite as in depth in that down at under 14s or under 16s. But the style of play that we were trying to get them to do and the skill set development that we were doing was the most important part. Sorry, take off mute. Just a question here from um, Cully Tucker, who's part of our own uh, elite uh, player development team here, and also coach of the, the Irish under 20s. Um, what um, is your opinion and process for getting messages onto players during matches, and what would be your process about half time? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a really interesting one. Um, so I've, I've sort of been in a uh, had a bit of experience with running water, uh, with being in the coach's box, uh, with being down at grass, grass levels. So for me, I, I sort of have a, probably a simple process around, I try and give them, uh, firstly, make sure they have, take a breath and everyone stop talking, uh, get their water on at half time, for example, and then giving them things around, well, what are we doing well here? So they, they then give that back to you. And then maybe one or two things and keep it as simple as that. Well, then what are the things we need to focus on? So another thing that I like to do at half time is, is get with the game drivers and make sure they're really clear on possibly the first scrum or the first line out structure that we're going to do after half time. Um, so we've played around with this a little bit uh, in the professional game around at half time uh, having a TV or an iPad in and you show them um, the structure of what you just you done at training you put that up so it might be uh, something that works really well is you might you know off a line out around halfway you might carry in the middle of the field then switch down the blind and you've done it at training so you'd show that training footage so when they get that opportunity for the first line out or first scrum, they then go through that. Um, so stuff like that. But for me, it's just really one or two clear, simple message of something they did well or something that they need to focus on. Um, Interest, interestingly, when you said it there initially, you, you discussed um, the way you put it them as well, what's going wrong or so what do we need to do here? And there's probably that perception that uh, posing questions is a slower means of getting the information. Um, so would that be something, would that be part of your co coaching? Would you always um, try and draw the answers out as opposed to, to telling or uh, imposing your own views? Yeah, 100%. Um, You've you got to give them the, uh, make sure they understand the why, the why they're doing something. Um, you know, you can sit there and go, we're going to do this, this, and this. This is what I want you to do. But if they don't understand why they're doing that, then you're not going to get everyone on board and you're not going to get everyone that understands. So the most important part is get it. If you've got 15 guys on the field, you don't want 10 of those not to really know what's going on. And if they give them the why, then they'll have a better understanding. Um, so I know you guys are probably similar, but... Over the last few years, a lot of New Zealand teams around the higher level um, do a lot of breathing, do a lot of connecting as a group. Um, so that's part of the process as well. So if you're under the sticks or there's been a penalty, um, you'll come together. So the leaders in the, in the team have a pretty good understanding of this. They normally do two or three breaths. And then prior to that, there's... A, you've already had the conversation with your leadership group that uh, you'll deliver this messages around attack, you'll deliver the messages around defense. Because what can happen in, in the heat of the moment, and some guys are a little bit more emotional and some guys are a little bit more yelly or, or don't actually have, give clear messages that everyone just talks at the same time. So having a, a real set process of so what we do in New Zealand and a lot of New Zealand teams is they get in a circle, they make sure their eyes are all connected, they do two or three quick breaths, and part of that's making sure they're all connected, and then they calm, and then they give the message. So you have an attack leader, a defensive leader, uh, and a game driver that 
this is what we're going to do. So it might be under the sticks. We're going to do a kickoff. We're going to go long here, blah, blah, blah. So it's really focused on what the next job is, not worrying about the mistake that you've just made. So a lot of teams over here, will we just call flush it. So you've got to flush it, you've got to breathe, and then you get on to the next path. So they'd, they'd have those, you'd have those roles selected similar to you yeah. with a vice captain and a captain. Yeah. So you have an attack leader, line out leader, uh, your scrum leader, your game drivers, and then you have a captain. So you don't want to make the captain do everything. Yeah. So it doesn't matter that, uh, do you do that down? So I've, I've implemented that to the first 15 team that I'm coaching. Uh, hasn't quite worked yet because we've lost two games, but uh, <laughs> hopefully uh, they, they are going through the process. They seem a lot calmer. Um, and the messages seem to be getting on. You just got, you just got to stay true to it. So that's uh, follow, follow your right. own advice. Um, yeah. Just a, a, a throwback question to earlier in the, the conversation there. Um, uh, just when you're in, in those original team meetings of goal setting, um, how much of it would have been uh, your own uh, perception, your own expectations, and you would have steered the conversation versus, or would you have gone in with a completely open mind um, with a view to seeing what's, what's the vision of the group of how they want to play the game? No, I, I think you need to steer them a little bit, uh, but you're giving them options as well. So just, just I keep going back to the school team because uh, we just sort of did it a few weeks ago and it's sort of clear in my mind, I suppose. I certainly had a vision that we discussed with the school, discussed with the other coaches and the management about what we were going to try and do and how we were going to do that to make the school team better. Um, so we delivered that to the players. And then we had some goals and expectations and put them in little groups and gave them lists of, to help them out. Um, and then they come back with some of their own. And so what it ended up being was, and they come back with some really good ones. So we put maybe two of the coaches and managers school group together and then two from the players. So then our four goals were a real collective and the two that they come back with, I actually hadn't even really thought of it. And I thought the way they, um, well, it was probably more the language they used in it, which I didn't really know, because I, I wasn't from the school. Um, you know, they were talking about protecting the factory, and I didn't really know what that meant. So I got them to explain that to me. So, and then I went into their changing rooms, and above it is, is a big thing that's been there for 30, 40 years. It's called the factory. So... You know, just little things like that. I, I wouldn't have known unless they'd spoken about that. I suppose, how, how important is it to use their language where you come into something like that? Or even yourself, you've been to Ireland, Italy, France, Japan, different cultures. How important is it to, to use their own lingo, even, even for terms like that and, and calls? Yeah, uh, massive and hugely. And I'll show you a slide in a minute, but that's... That's the, one of the biggest things because, and getting everyone to, to keep the same language. So even a simple thing as, um, you know, a little tip pass, when you're gonna tip it onto the forward, if you're in a, a pod off a nine, you know, getting those really that simple language right, because if you're calling it three different things, then the players get confused. So getting on board, sitting down with all of those guys around what language that they use and then everyone using that. Because if a coach comes in and has completely different language to what he's supposed to be around the ball carry, that's not the same as what the players use. And they don't, they, they can just create confusion. So getting that language rights uh, massive, I reckon. And that'll lead me into um, sort of roles and skill sets, which, um, which is something that's, really sort of quite big over in New Zealand and quite big. I'm not sure um, in Ireland if a, a lot of the teams in New Zealand, doesn't matter, all black, super level, uh, club level and provincial level and stuff, they, they theme a lot of their um, seasons, which is quite a cool way to do it. So then your theming could be around, uh, I've, I've used Mount Everest, I've Band of Brothers, 
um, lots of different themes, basketball teams, uh, football teams, just theming around what your seasons, seasons are like. I think Wayne Smith and Scott Robinson are really big on it. Um, so I'll try and share this and we'll see how it goes. Yeah, I've just set you up as host there, Corey, so um, you can take over the reins. Uh, the questions are still coming in, so feel free to, to keep posting the, the questions up in the chat. We'll try and get through as many uh, as we can. Apologies if we don't get to all of them, but Corey's no stranger, so we'll, uh, we'll be able to get back to him again. And the kids are going to school, so we're all good. <laughs> Another eight hours of this, so. Yeah. Uh, can you see my screen, I suppose? Yeah, we have you there, fire away. Does that got Sanex Blues roles and skill sets? Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, so this is something um, that I always sort of thought about, and it wasn't too, I was chatting to my brother, which he might go through with it uh, more next week. It's something that he, he was really big on. And so um, we're just sort of, so having a theme, so because um, I'm in Japan at the moment, and that's who I coach, um, so I call my type forwards, so I play a one three three one sort of system. Uh, I call my type forwards sumos. So our big boys, big sumos, uh, in the middle of the field. Uh, so I've given them all really clear roles. So we spent about uh, two or three weeks as a coaching group going over these. Uh, and some of it's really simple because I've got to sort of get this translated into Japanese. Um, which isn't as easy as it seems. So they've got a role. So your job is a sumo, which is my one, two, three, four, five, and number eight. So they operate in the middle of the field. So that's their main role. So from any set piece or any counter attack, after that's happened, they've got to get between the two 15 meters. And that's where they stay. Okay, so if I see them outside of there, they get a little, get in a fair bit of trouble. So their job for me is that they've got to dominate the gain line with their carry, their clean or their tackle. So we can do this, this is attack, but then you do a similar one with defense. Uh, they're about creating momentum because if you don't have go forward and momentum uh, in rugby, it's really difficult to play the brand of rugby that I want to try and play. Okay, and we're trying to create lightning quick balls. So we just call that LQB. So their job after they've had a scrum or a line out or there's been a kick is to position really quickly and to go again. So we call that bigger. So back in the game and go again. So that's, I have stats that have their bigger. They're either dead, dead or alive. So when they're walking or when they're not on their feet, they're dead. When they're alive, they're running. And then, so they're there to create space and width. So then we have we then go through some really key skill sets. So as you can see, there's quite a few there. Um, but I guess the most important bit around doing this, so this is a visual thing that's up in the uh, changing room, up in the clubhouse. Uh, they have it on their phone. And then when it becomes a review after a game, then I can sit down and go, well, did you nail your role? Were you between the 15s? Did you get the gain line? Does that make sense? So then all the language around the game, how you play, but then how you review it, then all stays the same. And the coaches are all on the same page around the language. So what we've put down here is, um, you know, ask to pass, for example. So what does that mean? If I said that to one of you guys. I guess you might not better talk, but <laughs> I think they might be all muted. You probably have to pull them off to pull them off mute to get them. Uh, get the voice right. So the language is 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 probably the most important bit. So ask to pass for me is that wherever that pass has come from, when I go to place the ball, my ask should be pointing to where the pass has come from. Because what happens in a game is that when you carry and you think it's an easy option to carry in. Uh, a good seven or a good jackler will get on top of that and steal it. But if you can carry out and get the ball away from the inside and fold out or place out, 
us to pass, then hopefully you shouldn't turn the ball over. Yeah. That that cool? So then if I look at our ninjas, so theming it, so my nines, tens, twelves, and fifteens, I put them in a group. So they're your game drivers. They're your, I just call them ninjas because ninjas are smart, fast, little. So they have a real clear role and real clear skill sets that they then have to try and work on every day to get better. And I've done this at school level, so it's not that um, it's just professional stuff. So I've even I've put it down to lower levels. 100% less skills, less roles, but it still works well. So then my last one, I call them samurais. So our six and seven. So when I, when I play the shape of one, three, three, one, I have my six and seven on the edge. So those guys stay out on the edges, uh, one on each side, if that makes sense. And they've got a clear role, clear skill sets. So then the coaching group, the playing group, all understand this, go through this, and then there's no confusion around the language that you're using. Interestingly, there you have the, the six, seven, eleven, fourteen in the in the same category, same category of skill set, and probably in the southern hemisphere, there's been a lot more interchangeability of sixes and sevens to wingers. You know, who've who've either uh, moved inwards you know, late in their careers or in the elite side of their careers are, are moved outwards from, you know, guys who've maybe been in a back row, back row in a 20s World Cup to become wingers and vice versa. Yeah, so I guess this group's classified like that because of where they operate. So they, they operate outside the 15. 100% there's times they've got to be in the middle of the field. But for us to play the style of footy that we want, uh, that's around speed, space and skill, then these guys from a set piece or a kick or a anything need to find and hold their width. And when they're out there, they need to create and finish those opportunities. So that's sort of their job to do that. Um, and so I've got, I think there's a key one there around uh, zero rut focus or creating momentum. So if you play wide, wide, um, I believe that in between that 15 and out on the edges, that if you can do a really good job there to get the, make the defence not get set, then you're taking pressure off the sumos, the guys that have to carry that real tough carry from the sideline. So I'm not sure if you, um, if you watched the sort of style of footy that Japan tried to play uh, at the World Cup was around speed and, and skill and offloading and keeping that ball alive. Well, part of that was because they didn't have big carriers in the middle of the field. So if they did that out on the edges, that took a lot of those carries and big collisions off those guys in the middle of the field. So once they got good moment, momentum on the edge or lightning quick ball, then they were able to go wide, wide. But there's a catch-22 because you can't just go wide, wide without earning the right to go wide, wide. So we've got to upskill all those sort of guys, our six, our seven, our wingers, to be better in that space. Because it's the toughest carry in the game is that carry off a sideline for a, for a tight forward. So if we can help him out by doing a better job on the edge, then um, you know, that saves his collisions. You mentioned there having the, the players having the skill set to, to execute these roles or having the, the full skill set for the role they're doing. Um, like that's probably a balance of do you, do you change your philosophy or do you develop the skills? So if you're, if you're in a team and the full array of skills aren't there or there are certain players having the skill sets to perform certain roles, do you reduce your philosophy of playing or restrict how you're going to play in some way? Or do you go the longer route and, and develop that skill with a view to keeping, yeah, I, keeping your philosophy? Yeah, I go the longer route. I, I've just tried to develop the skill, um, which, is, which is really difficult if you don't have a lot of time. So an example of the first 15 team that I'm trying to coach is that we've got a lot of young guys in this year. 
So this year they have, so we do it in years. Like, so year 11 is when you're about 15, 16, and it goes to year 13 um, in New Zealand schools. So half of my team are year 11. So they've still got two more years um, in the first 15. So I've got 13 players that are year 11 and 13 players that are year 13. So that was another reason why I wanted to coach and help the school out was because they're a really young team. Uh, we're not the biggest team, so we've got to find a way to play the game that the philosophy of how we want to play with speed, skill and space. So I've now probably going to hopefully be, help them out for a couple of years. So then when they're year 13, they should have developed a lot of these skill sets and have a better understanding. So the results might not quite be coming at the moment, but I believe down the future that they will. Yep. Uh, well, that's, that's a difficult balance, isn't it? Where, oh, it is, spe yeah. especially if you're in a, in a role to get results as a coach and. Well, that's right. So, um, yeah. And, yeah. So far touch wood, I've tried to keep the philosophy and the way I want to try and play the game. Um, haven't lost too many roles yet, but you never know. I know what the business is like. Part and parcel of it. Yeah. But I think this is a really good way around roles and skill sets uh, to have up in your changing rooms so everyone's really clear of what you want them to do. Um, and look, it doesn't have to be as in depth, it doesn't have to be as much detail in it. Um, like the first 15 ones um, sort of reduced in a lot of the content, but a couple of the key things around um, creating you know, winning the gain line, getting momentum, that's certainly in there. Positioning fast, things like that. Um, I'll stop sharing that. Okay. Gonna throw, um, if you throw the host back to me there, Corey, as well, and I'll see just did any questions come in on that side. There was one question earlier, Gavin, Gavin Duffy, who you'd know from Balanan and Gold Regions. Um, how much of an emphasis would you have on giving players a, a free reign to make decisions in the moment um, versus having your set plays or your, um, your, your, your strategies and um, having different options within them? So that you know you're 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 given set plays, but you're given a, a limited amount of freedom within it, versus a completely laissez-faire. So, what what balance in between there would you would you play? Uh, so I think if you focus on a lot of decision making and skill sets, then you're able to have, a, have quite a good balance, um, and quite a good balance around how they do that and when they do that. But for me, the so structured attack is, is a really important part of the game, but it's probably, depending on what level you're at, um, unstructured prob is probably the most important. <laughs> but it's, you, you have to have structure. You have to have a line out, a launch, and understand where you're going. Um, but I think that you've got to have a, a really good balance between it. So normally, um, if I'm coaching, if I was coaching at super level, like we might go in with five or six structured lineouts. That's probably around the limit that they can main, uh, train through the week and have that nailed for Saturday. Um, and your sort of scrum structures will change depending on the defense. But it's sort of five or six line-out structures uh, at at the Super Rugby levels, probably about the limit. So oh, then, what? the majority Sorry. of it is done around uh, unstructured um, playing what's in front of them. So if everyone does their role and their job within the team and in the shape that you're trying to play, then you're able to to sort of get that. So does that make sense? 
Good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you'd, uh, so they're nearly holding their positions. They're holding their positions, and they've they've a lot of freedom within that. Yes. So, so going back to the big picture around speed, skill, and space, then so there's going to be space somewhere if if everyone does their job. And the difficult bit with rugby and how that's evolved and changing and developing is that its defences are getting so much better. So you've now got to try and find innovative ways. And maybe some of that's around your structure, around a special or a trick play um, to try and create or we'll break it into unstructured. So I sort of just break it down like that. So if we have a kickoff, we have a attack plan for our kickoff, a, a kick strategy for when we're exiting, a counterattack uh, policies, for example, and you've got some unstructured uh, footy that you're trying to get to. Um, sort of, I'm pretty big on unstructured rugby. And then you've got your structured around your set piece. So then putting that into a plan through the week of your training, just making sure that if it's super rugby level, that I'm giving those guys the start of the week time to learn those structures. Uh, and they're changed every week. There might be a tweak, it might be the same area, but there's, um, because defense is a little bit different, you make a tweak to it. What, um, roughly in, 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 in the rugby you play in, in Japan and New Zealand, what phase would you have it planned to? I suppose quite often up here you might have three phases in advance planned or, or five phases in advance. Um, how far would you go before you, you put the, the reins completely in the players? Yeah, it's a really interesting one, that, because um, I, I remember when, when I was playing a long time ago and the Brumbies and the Australian teams, when they had Gregan and Larkin, like they had... They had it up to 10, 12 phases mapped out of what they were doing. Um, so I certainly don't think um, international rugby, maybe Joe Smith was a wee bit different, but most guys are really just two or three phases. Um, and then they're just into that shape. So we talk about shapes, like it could be one, three, three, one. It could be, um, you know, two, four, two, which what's used to happen a few years ago. The guys have sort of moved away from that. So at the moment, I'm sort of playing around with a new shape, which um, I'm sort of trying to call it 21, I suppose, is that I'm going to have two forwards and one, uh, one back. Sorry, round the other way. So yeah, two forwards, one back. So if I have a winger in the 15 with a two and a seven, for example, and then I have my two midfielders in the middle of the field with uh, so 12 will be with um, a lock and a prop. 13 will be with um, his prop and the other lock. And then you'll have our uh, six and eight on the other edge with the winger and 10 and 15 floating in between. So um, I've been looking at that and working around that through in Japan. It looks like if you've got a good skill set uh, and you've got guys that like to offload, um, I think it's going to be quite an interesting way to play the game. And would would they those? The space. There could be a new <laughs> shape out there. But would, would, would those group of three be playing as a pod, or would you have the the back sitting in behind? So yes. Could... So still your ten and fifteen in behind. So one of the so one of the reasons I thought around uh, the midfielders is, is they're actually normally pretty good uh, distributors around passing. Uh, good offloaders, good carriers. Um, and the other thing is that there's a bit of space on the edges, but sometimes it's quite difficult to get there. So now if you had a couple more powerful units out on the edges as well, you can get the ball there a bit quicker and they can be a little bit more dominant on the edge. Brilliant. The, the yeah. questions are flowing in, so uh, uh, participants bear with me and I'll try and get to as many as I can. Just a, a number of people there querying just on the shape. Would um, the one three three one shape? Do you change that depending on the area of the pitch? Or the the other side of that question is if you yeah. if you have to if you have to replace personnel, 
and bring a different player in, would you change the shape based on that? No. So on that last question, um, I really like to to keep it six and seven. The only the only time is sometimes off a line out, uh, you might flip your uh, two and six around. So if you've got a really good dynamic two, um, that he can play that role off a line out structure, might stay on the edge. Uh, but but. No, so around going back to skill development, really trying to upskill those those individuals to be able to play in those roles. So then, if you're really clear on your roles and your skill sets, then those individual players know that that's what they've got to work on. And everyone's different; everyone has strengths and weaknesses. But my six does this job because what I've found over, I guess, from experience, is that if you keep changing the personnel and the numbers that then creates confusion. So your structure looks like this. You're gonna you know, play wide, then get into a one, three, three, one. Well, they know their job. And then it's looking at that technical skill around well, did they do their job, you know? Um, would that change if you were, would, it, would you have a different shape coming out of defense or when you get close to the opposition line, do you? Do you yeah, so it does, so 100% does change. So. So what I sort of try to work on is um, when you get into that 22, if, for example, you might have three phases going the same way to beat them speed around the corner. So then you'd, you'd slowly change that. But you'd do it in a way that, so if, let's say you had a line out on the 22 and the wing or the 12 carried and the seven went into that breakdown, well, that, that wing and seven would then drop to the edge with the midfielder, then the next pod comes around and carries, the next pod comes around and carries. So they're all sort of getting up and reloading. I think one of the things that used to frustrate me a lot uh, in a lot of rugby, it doesn't matter if it was in Ireland or in New Zealand, was getting our type forwards constantly trying to go around the corner. when they're the ones that were doing all the work in a scrum or a line out or a mall, but then we expected them to do all the running as well. So if we can try and make them a little bit more efficient and effective in their movements or their actions, then that should help them scrum or line out more, but also carry. But if we're gassing them uh, too much, then they just become sort of a little bit useless. So you, you mentioned there on the getting into that unstructured um, play and the, the importance of it. How do you coach that? What's your What's your own format? Is there any techniques that you use to that are effective in coaching the unstructured? I think you yeah, you yeah. you mentioned me when we were talking last week of um, creating chaos environments and you know to, to yeah. really challenge the players. Hundred percent. So really planned, good good planning with your training session, but a lot of small sided games. I enjoy enjoy my games. I know a lot of guys that I that are on here that I coached with was a big advocate of small sided games. So, and making little tweaks to those all the time. But at the moment, what I've sort of been doing um, and is around shock training, I call it. So what we're trying to do is train sort of 20 or 30% over speed of, of what um, they play in a game. So let's say the ball's in play in whatever level you're at. The ball, ball might be in play for 30 minutes, which is quite a long time in rugby. I think at the World Cup, it might have got up to uh, average around maybe 32 minutes. So you, I probably needed to have this conversation before Ireland played Japan because Japan had uh, set you up pretty well, actually, to be fair. So they knew that going into that game, they've been, they've been training this for a long time, for well over 18 months uh, around this overspeed. So they were trying to get the ball in play in that Irish game and Scottish game, the two games that they won, uh, close to 40 minutes. So they nearly got it, I believe, against Ireland. I think it was 38 minutes and then the Scottish game was 39 minutes was the ball in play. So Japan had a long time to prepare for the, the World Cup as a group. Uh, so part of their training was they did a lot of contact because that was where they were always uh, had a weakness. Um, so they got really resilient and tough in that space, but they overtrained and at speed. 
they're calling it. So they call it shock. So they were training for 40 minutes over speed, so 20% faster than they were. And the coaches were just doing that um, coaching in the moment. So there's no stopping. It was the, the trainer just had the, the, cl the clock going. So if there was uh, unstructured kick counter, all of that stuff was just done at a high, high level, at a higher speed than they would have played the game. So when they play the game, it's just easy. It's actually not as hard as their training. So um, they did that really well in those two games. Uh, you might have guessed them for the South Africa team, and South Africa are a different beast as well. So. But does a lot of that. Does the coach then have to be very comfortable with failure or mistakes? Yeah. Because if you're if you're starting out at that overspeed, I'd imagine, you know, you're going to start off getting it wrong most of the time, or or causing mistakes because you're doing things to such an intensity. Yeah, hundred percent. So, and the other thing that happens at trainings is that when you have a scrum or a line out, it slows it down. So what we would do, or what we do is have those in the unit sessions. I know it's a little bit difficult. We're only doing two, uh, two days a week. But when you've got a little bit of time that, so you have your units, you have your scrums and lineups. They, that scrum and line out in this type of shock session will only start it, only start the play. And then everything else is done over speed. So how we plan it out, it's, it's quite full on. Um, you, you get a lot of your conditioning and fitness in it as well. So you might start at one end of the field, kick the ball down the other. They've got a you know, three-phase kick, so they've got to go for three phases, then they'll kick it back. And you're going for a minute and a half, two minutes. So what we ended up getting some of um, Sunwolves in Japan up to was close to six or seven minutes of playing at that speed in one go. So then you're training and you're with GPS and all that now, you're able to see and keep that ball in play. You're making sure that all their numbers and metrics were hitting the right where you had to be so that we weren't reproducing the overspeed and overplaying. And uh, did, I suppose, did the, did the players buy into that from, from the outset or did they get frustrated at being nearly challenged beyond capability? Oh, 100% it's tough on them, but they, they do get a little bit frustrated, but they really enjoy it as well. And it's really enjoyable for uh, coaches coaching in the moment like that. So you've got six or seven balls, guys are running around like madmen, um, and it's just sort of how to scout it. But you're not on the field for a huge amount of time. You don't have to spend extra time doing conditioning. Uh, so there's a lot, of, lot more benefits out of it. Uh, it's just sometimes you've got to make sure you, you balance it out with your set piece and some of the detail around the breakdown and things like that. And I suppose from the elite side of the game, how comfortable would the S&C coaches and the physios have been with that format of training? Um, I know here, they, they, there probably is, we, we go the other way, we limit the amount and sometimes the intensity on the pitch um, in favour of... Um, getting the conditioning sessions in as well or getting the maximum out of them? Yeah, so, um, so you, still, you still need the, the other stuff. Uh, it's just making sure that it's all not slow and, and long in that type of training. So if you put it in once or twice a week, if you've got a professional setup, then you can do that. You've got time to do that. Um, but I think... That, then it's going back to well, how do you, what style of rugby do you want to play? How do you want to play it? And it all sort of ties into that. So Japan, for example, of Japan, um, knew that they're never going to be able to um, play 10-man rugby and, and set-piece teams and stuff. So they had to put Ireland or Scotland into the washing machine and make them really, really pay that way. So... And all of the players really brought into that for a long period of time. And, you know, I guess the way they played at the World Cup was uh, a pretty awesome sort of style of footy to watch. Um, and, yeah, you know, I thought they were the, certainly a, a team to watch at that World Cup. But there's no, there's no, because I do it with my school team. I do it with my club team at Sanex. 
So there's, yeah, I, I think you could do it at any level. There's it doesn't a, have to be international rugby. There's a huge amount of kind of faith in that. If you're if you're planning for something that eighteen that's eighteen months away, and similarly if 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 that's a national team directive and you're with the Sunwolves, and they're asking you to do this, but it may not be effective for you in the day in in the weekly games that you're involved in. No, so it was a and, and that's right, and it was a really difficult um, situation for the Sunwolves to be in, but we all knew the bigger picture, uh, and I think that's why Jamie uh, Joseph. And Tony asked me to get involved because they were able, I was able to see the big picture and to see the plan. And we certainly weren't going out as a Sunwolves group to, um, you know, to, to lose games and stuff. We still wanted to, to be really competitive and play really good rugby. But we knew that there was going to be times throughout the Super Rugby season last year that we wouldn't have the players and certain players. But we knew going into it around what Jamie's vision was for Japan. And would they, like the, the backers of the club or the owners of the board, would they have been all part of that buy-in? That was, that was out of purpose. my pay grade for that one. But, uh, uh, but well, that's, that's the most important bit, really. It doesn't matter what team you're, you're doing. I think it's just making sure everyone understands of the style of rugby you're trying to play, what your philosophy is what your goals are and then from that that's when I set up my um, roles and skill sets and then getting all the language the same and then we're all trying to always trying to just get better every day at that. Brilliant, brilliant. I'd, um, I'd initially earmarked um, quarter past 10 as being the, 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 the finishing time. I know I hadn't given out a finishing time but given the, the level of engagement and the number of people here and, and how engaged they are and the question flowing. And my apologies for not getting through um, the number of questions that are there. Um, I suppose that's both the, the intensity of the questions and maybe my technical ability there are at, are at fault. Um, but I suppose before we close, um, is there anything you'd like to touch on, uh, Corey, that we haven't... Um, had a chance to get her Im implemented within it or any thoughts yourselves from your own movement of, of seeing rugby in Ireland and, and, uh, and New Zealand, the differences and what we could learn from each other? Um, oh no, I, look, I thought the way Irish rugby's um, come along a huge, huge way. I think they're an awesome team. Um, so just, I don't know, just hopefully it gets back up playing soon. It's pretty strange times. It's been really good that the rugby started here in New Zealand. And I think we're really, really fortunate to get that done because it looked like that we weren't going to get any footy. Um, so hopefully you guys get back up playing and you can get back into training and, and just get back into doing stuff that you love. And I think that's, that's the most important thing. If you're passionate about it and really enjoy it, um, then, yeah, just keep doing what you love doing, I reckon those opportunities will come along.